this syndrome. And in order to understand that, it's an extension of Dr. Ackerman's talk, we, got, we need to understand that long QT syndrome is a, a disease entity, but it separates into genotype, which um, expose themselves and differently. And this is an important point. Before I begin my talk, I would like to again recognize the legacy of Alpha Mas, who established the International QTS Registry, who got us to where we are here, and um, to that to get this type of great collaboration between Mike and Wojciech and all of us here and the the great QTS team that I'm going to show later. <laughs> they are here. So again. Um, in order to understand how to treat our patients better, it, we need to understand that there are important genotype-phenotype correlation in long QT syndrome, and I'm going to present that. And then it's also too important to identify that there's, there are important genotype and mutation-specific restratification data that we need to consider in order to identify who should be treated and what type of medications and what type of strategies should be treated. So, Again, long QT syndrome is considered to be a single disease, but it's not actually because the genotype accepts, express themselves differently. And after that, I will present genotype-specific management in long QT syndrome. And again, as Mike mentioned, there are 17 identified LQTS genotype and the number is increasing, but the majority of those are long QT1, long QT2, and long QT3 that I'm going to focus in my talk, but there are also important considerations for other genotypes that were identified. And as you see, the expression of this disease is different. For example, in LKT1, most of the events are triggered by exercise, LKT2 by emotional um, triggers, and in LKT3, most of the events may occur even during rest, so there are no triggers. So despite the fact, again, that this is the one disease entity, the expression is totally different. And then, of course, the response to medical therapy may be different, as you will all see. And because of that, we had attempted to have and to create and establish genotype-specific restratification algorithm in long QT syndrome. So in LQT1, we identified initially that the transmembrane mutations are associated with the high risk, and then subsequently, there are important C-loop mutations that respond to sympathetic activation, exercise, adrenaline, and in those areas, if the mutation is located here, the risk is substantially higher. And as you see here, the risk of life-threatening events, a body cardiac arrest and sudden cardiac death in LKT1 patients who have C-loop mutations is significantly higher. At age 33, at age 40, the risk is 33%. And again, I'm not talking about those who are protected with beta blockers, but independently, patients who have those types of mutations appear to be at the highest risk. Also, it's important to distinguish between the important sex differences in LKT1, in LKT2, and LKT3. In LKT1, the risk of life threatening events appears to be very high in males, boys, until the onset of adolescence, and then it goes down, whereas in females, the risk is very low until the onset of adolescence, and then it decreases. And accordingly, we created a genotype-specific restratification scheme in LKT1 patients in which those who have had a prior syncope, especially on beta blockers, those who have a prolonged QTC, mutation in the C loops, um, either males or females or just males by themselves, especially before the onset of adolescence, appear to be at the highest risk, whereas those at the lowest risk of a relatively more narrow low, uh, QTC, non c mutations, women before the onset of adolescence, and no prior syncope. So you see that we can have a genotype-specific restratification in long QT syndrome. And the same things goes for LKT2 we see that mutations that are located in the pole region appear to be at the highest risk. And we see that the risk of cardiac events at the age of 40 is significantly higher among patients, LKT2 patients who have mutations in the pole region as compared with other mutations. And here we see something different. We see that the risk in LKT2 for both males and females Appear to be, appears to be very, relatively long before the onset of adolescence, 
because of interaction of sex hormones in the genotype and IKR, the potassium channel associated with the genetic disorder. And after the onset of adolescence, women appear to be at the very high risk, at the highest risk. And this goes even in the postpartum period in the perimenopausal period. So this is an important distinction, distinction in LKT2. And based on this, we have also created a genotype specific risk certification scheme for LKT2 patients in which those who have a history of syncope, have a prolonged QTC, have a poor loop mutation, or women after the onset of adolescence, they appear to be at the highest risk. Even in LKT3, there appears to be mutations that have a higher risk and low risk, as you see here. Here, there are important mutations that increase the risk significantly. And this goes to genotype-specific management in long QT syndrome. And I'm gonna start with the guidelines. The guidelines actually do not distinguish between genotype. And I'm, I'm gonna go even further after describing the guidelines. So class one indication, meaning this is like a uniform, uniform and consensus management strategy suggests that in, LKT, in patients with long QT syndrome with a resting QTC greater than 470, beta blocker therapy is recommended. So this goes for all LKTS patients, and this is not considering the subset that we just discussed previously, previously patients who have a genetic diagnosis but a phenotype negative, meaning a QTC in the normal range. I'm gonna to get to this subset later. Another class one recommendation is patients who are high risk LKTS patients who remain symptomatic, in whom beta blocker is ineffective, meaning that there is recurrent syncope on beta blocker or beta blocker therapy is not tolerated, intensification of therapy with additional medications guided by consideration of particular genotype. And this is something that we're gonna to get to, we discussed earlier. We can, we can attempt to have less cardiac sympathetic denervation or even consideration of an ICD in this high risk subset of LKTS patients who remain symptomatic. There's also a recommendation to go above and beyond beta blocker therapy in patients who do have an ICD but still experience recurrent appropriate ICD shocks in this subset, we can also consider left cardiac sympathetic denervation. There's also a class 2A recommendation, meaning that there's a general consensus, but the level of recommendation is a little lower. And in this subset, asymptomatic LKTS patients, and this is the, the subset that I described earlier, that they do still have a relatively high risk of events, in these patients with a phenotype negative, meaning a QTC below 470, in this subset, also chronic therapy with beta blocker is also reasonable. There's also a class 2B recommendation in LKTS patients who have remained asymptomatic with a resting QTC greater than 500 to be even more aggressive beyond beta blocker therapy and to consider left cardiac sympathetic denervation and also an ICD, and it is also gui guided by the genotype. But this is a class 2B recommendation, meaning that, that there is a de debate and controversy in this area. And to summarize this, we should give beta blockers to all LKTS patients, those who have been resuscitated by cardiac arrest. Following that, they should get beta blocker and ICD. And if there's also symptoms of recurrent shock despite ICD and beta blockers, possibly intensification of treatment with cardiac, left cardiac sympathetic denervation, which is a more invasive procedure, but it can be minimally invasive. In patients who are phenotype negative, but they do have long QT syndrome, beta blocker is still recommended. And if they have persistent symptoms, intensification of therapy. In patients who are phenotype positive, again, beta blockers, and if the patient remains symptomatic, the patient should be considered for left cardiac sympathetic denervation on ICD. And in all patients, QTC prolonging drugs, hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia should be not recommended, should be, the patient should be not, not be, uh, get away from that, not 
avoid this type of management, avoid QTC prolonging drug, hypokalemia or hypermagnesemia. But, but we see that there is a different response. And this is the reason I mentioned earlier that long QT syndrome is not, a, is not a single entity. So there's a different response to beta blocker therapy by genotype. And we see that LKT1 patients on beta blockers appear to be the, the highest responders, whereas in LKT2 and LKT3, there's a lower response rate to those who are on beta blocker therapy. And we also see that there's a different response by mutation type in LKT1. We have shown that among patients who have specific mutations or CLIP mutations that are more responsive to sympathetic activation to adrenaline, there's a higher response, almost 90% reduction in the risk of life threatening events, whereas other mutations appear to be less responsive, but there's still a very low rate of events on beta blocker therapy. There's also a response by the type of beta blocker. And this, is, this especially goes for LKT2 patients in whom nadolol appears to be a very, very effective beta blocker with almost a 90% reduction in the risk of life threatening events. And we see that the residual rate of life threatening events in LKT2 patients and LKT1 appears to be higher in those who have had prior syncope and especially women after the onset of adolescence, again, despite beta blocker therapy. And this finding again suggests that there's a genotype specific, specific response to medical therapy in long QT syndrome and especially beta blockers. There have been, I mentioned that hypokalemia, low potassium levels should be avoided in LKTS patients and especially in LKT2 there have been studies that try to elevate potassium levels and to reduce the risk of cardiac events in LKT2 patients by giving potassium increasing therapy like KCL, spironolactone. This study worked well in the lab and we see that there's a significant reduction in QTC following administration of spironolactone or increasing potassium. However, in the setting of a large randomized clinical trial, that we have attempted. Spironolactone actually was associated with side effect, too much eleva elevation of, of potassium. And this study was discontinued. And accordingly, currently, there, it, there is a general recommendation to elevate potassium levels above four mil equivalents per liter in LQTS patients, especially LQT2. We have also shown recently that there's a different response to beta blocker therapy in LKT3 in males versus females. And here we see something very interesting. The risk of cardiac events in LKT3 patients was 83% lower on beta blockers in women, whereas in men, there was not a statistically significant effect in the risk of cardiac events in beta blockers. However, we see that when we look at life-threatening events, beta blocker therapy was all, were also effective in males. The, the, it wasn't statistically significant, but there was a 50% reduction and 80, significant 80% reduction in women. And we see that the lowest rate, and this is an important takeaway message, take home message is the fact that those who remain on beta blockers, they are compliant with beta blockers. The risk of life threatening events appears to be very low, lowest in women in LKT3, but also in males. Because LKT3 is a different genotype, and as I mentioned in LKT1 and LKT2, the potassium channel is affected. In LKT3, the sodium channel is affected. There have been studies that showed that sodium blockers, nexilatine and flaconide, and also ranolazine can shorten the QTC and be effective in the management in LKT3 patients who are not responsive to beta blocker. So this is another genotype specific therapy, mixilatin, flaconide, and walonazine in a study that we carried out here showing that it's effective in LKT3 patients. Left cardiac sympathetic denovation, I mentioned that, that this is also goes to the guidelines because as you know, the response the, the risk of events in LKTS patients, in, especially in LKT1, appears to be triggered 
by sympathetic activation, meaning adrenaline during exercise, emotional stress. So having this type of denovation, less response to adrenaline appears to be most effective in LKT1 patients and possibly a higher residual rate in LKT2. In LKT it appears to be also effective in LKT3 patients. So this also should be considered as another therapeutic options, which may be genotype specific for those who do not respond, respond to beta blocker therapy. So in summary, as you all showed, as you all, as we, we also showed, see, so here, beta blocker therapy is highly effective in LKT8 patients if appropriate subtype is identified, especially in Adderall and LKT2, if the beta blocker therapy is administered at the highest tolerated dose and there's no interruption in treatment. But we do have to remember that there's also a genotype specific approach and there's a genotype specific response to beta blocker therapy. And this can also be used to improve risk stratifications and management of LKTS patients. And thank you. And I would also like to, again, thank our LKTS group. Hopefully they are here. I hope you, you're all able to see them. Um, Chris, Bonnie, Becky, thank you. And this is open for questions. See that we lost Wojciech. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? I need to look at the chat box. There is a question about the fact that the chart seems to stop at, at the results at the age of 40. Will all the patients be discussed later? In our studies, we tried to look at the, until the age of 40, because after that, the risk of cardiac events and sudden cardiac death may be actually be biased by coronary artery disease and also by uh, additional reasons for sudden cardiac death. So there are additional comorbidities, but we did actually publish a large study in circulation on the risk of life-threatening events after the age of 40, and the risk appears to be similar. I mean, there's also the genotype specific risk appears to be similar. So the management strategy should be similar even after the age of 40. And then there's another question about what is the beta blocker recommendation for LKT1? So maybe I would like to make it, make it interactive and possibly get the input from Mike Ackerman. What do you think about beta blocker management in general? Because you have been a role model in treating those patients very intensively. Well, first, uh, Elon, I, I really enjoy your talk. I thought that was incredibly um, comprehensive and short time. I, uh, for my LQT1 patients, uh, I like natalol and propranolol the best. So if I have my preference, I use natalol almost exclusively. If they don't tolerate natalol, we potentially try a lateral move to propranolol. We never use metoprolol or atenolol, the beta-1 selective beta blockers. Um, if we achieve satisfactory natalol, propranolol, beta blocker effect, and we haven't converted the patient into a beta blocker zombie, meaning their quality of life on beta blocker is to their satisfaction, we are really, really pleased with life on beta blocker for that LQT1 person and we probably will never need to escalate therapy beyond that. If on the other hand, they are a beta blocker intolerant individual or they become that beta blocker zombie and we probably have an enriched collection of them because they know of our surgical expertise with denervation therapy as an option and they're choosing that option or for quality of life purposes, we would move that LQT1 person to uh, denervation and low dose natalol and increasingly denervation solo therapy. So one time therapy with denervation only, obviously with a carefully selected uh, patient. And that's because uh, left cardiac sympathetic denervation's therapeutic efficacy is absolutely greatest in LQT1. Thank you. 
Mike, maybe you wanna, there's another question about left cardiac sympathetic innovation. Maybe just share your experience with this, the efficacy. What is the risk of the procedure according to your experience? Yeah, I think it depends. So we've had the luxury of having the largest denervation uh, surgical program in the world. Uh, we've done over 300 plus uh, left cardiac sympathetic denervations at Mayo Clinic. Um, the videoscopic approach is minimally invasive such that 95% of the patients are dismissed the day after surgery. Recovery in general is very fast. Uh, return to full competitive sports, for example, is, is, is within days, a week. Um, the single greatest post denervation sequelae that still bothers me uh, is that we have about a five to 10% rate of post denervation neuropathic pain. And if you are that 10 percenter who's experiencing that post-operative uh, sequelae, uh, that is no fun. And uh, it does go away, but we're talking a frustrating set of weeks and months before the neuropathic pain resolves. Um, the neuropathic pain has a clustering. So the 10% is overrepresented by adult women who have also had, you know, chronic pain syndrome, fatigue, uh, chronic myalgias, and things like that. So there may be a predisposition of the kind of person who's more likely to experience the post denervation neuropathic pain. Um, but that's the one sequelae that that tempers my enthusiasm from the notion of letting denervation solo therapy overtake beta blocker. I think beta blocker, like you said, is still first line therapy. And it's only after that, um, and depending on how you tolerate that, that you start thinking about beta blocker alternative strategies. Thank you, Mike. It's great to get you from your experience. And we're actually in the process of comparing this type of a, a treatment in a specialized center to other centers and we're seeing interesting results. So I just got a message from Dr. Zoriba from Wojciech that his internet went down, he's gonna to try to join us. So for the sake of time, I will move to the next talk, uh, talk which is uh, Dr. Spencer Rosero. Um, he's the chief of cardiology here at the University of Rochester Center who has been collaborating with us for many years. He's part of our group, research group, and he's going to talk about COVID treatment and QT prolongation. Uh, Spencer, the stage is yours. <laughs> 